What's up guys? CJ and I just spur of the moment, we were about to crack a beer and we decided let's turn the camera on and have a conversation once and for all. Braid or fluoro? Which one do you need? What's the best one? I don't know if there's a true answer, but look, this is totally unplanned. We're just gonna shoot the shit. We're gonna talk about these lines when to use this one, when to use this one, when not to use them, pros and cons of both, so that hopefully it can shed some light on, do you wanna use floral? Do you wanna use braid? Let's have a beer and do it. Are you ready, CJ? Let's do it. All right, let's go. Welcome to the Hookup Tackle. The Hookup Tackle is the world's largest showcase of Mega Bass products, featuring baits and colors not found at any other dealer. The Hookup also offers a wide display of OSP, Evergreen, Depths, Lucky Craft, Jackal, and many more. The Hookup Tackle is owned and operated by family, is staffed by guides and verified tackle nerds who love helping anglers elevate their craft. If you're in the Phoenix area, we'd love to have you stop by our showroom and check out the wonderful world of Mega Bass and the Hookup for yourself. If you shop online, there are almost 10,000 SKUs of Mega Bass products alone with hundreds of other companies and new products being added daily. So next time you're looking for that hard to find bait, that color your fish have never seen before, or maybe you just wanna elevate your game, look at thehookuptackle.com. Welcome back my friends. I am Ben with The Hookup Tackle, The Tackle Otaku on Instagram, being joined by my good buddy, Desert Bassin, CJ, what's up, dude? How's it going, man? Dude, this is so much better than Jeff. Oh, I'm so excited for this. That loser never drinks with me. I love the sound. Oh, yeah. That's good. Cheers. Cheers, Come pie, my friend. Come pie. Mm hmm Hopefully, you guys are having a wonderful day. If you're not drinking one of these delicious cold Orions from the beautiful island of Okinawa, your day can't possibly be as good as ours, but we're going to bring you in to our circle we're gonna drink and talk about some line. This is a heated conversation around the shop all the time. A lot of us have similar thoughts to the answer. What's better, floral versus braid, or what technique is better on each. So we're just gonna have an open conversation about it because we get questions every day, people come to the store, questions about what line, uh, why to use this one, why to use that one. So we're just gonna break it down. Sound good? Sounds good. All right, why don't I lead since I'm obviously the leader. <laughs> You're the one in front of the camera here. Right. Let's start there. And then uh, just throw stuff in. Okay. Spitfire. You're the you're the audience and, and I'm basically the, the god on stage. Gotcha. Let's do mm -hmm. this. I got a lot of questions for you. You know my perspective on this, so I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Okay. So let's go. So braid versus fluoro. Now, I would say over the last 20 years for sure, we've seen a huge shift in lines. When I first started in this industry as a professional, I guess, in 99, early 2000, Copoly was still like the line of choice. P-Line had just kind of become a thing. It was so much stronger and so much harder and so much you know more abrasion resistant than mono that we've all been using it. We were using like XT, Triline XT and Stren, right? So we had gone from bullshit to kind of co-poly and Floral was just kind of starting to really make an impact on the scene. Braid was also starting to make an impact on the scene and a lot of guys started going full braid, a lot of guys started going full Floral and nothing was really understood about any of them and so you were finding guys that would you know, go all braid, and then three months later, they'd be like, fuck that braid, you know, put all floral on there, and then fuck that floral, back to P-line, right? So over the years, it's had this strange kind of transition, and we've learned more and more about each line and what each one does better. And it's fun to have these conversations. At the end of the day, there is no concrete right or wrong about any of this. This is all a system and personal preference. So if something is working for you, then stick with it. I'm a big component of not fixing something that's not broken. So if you're using braid, for instance, you're casting great, you're getting everything you need out of the distance, you're getting bit, you're, they're biting it, you're landing them, like everything's working for you, then you better not fucking change, right? And same goes with this. If everything's working for you in this and it's working fine, then stay there. 
What I like about conversations like this is we all go through periods where we hit a, a stumbling point or something derails or something starts going wrong, right? Maybe it's we're not getting the casting distance that we wanted. Maybe it's we're breaking off fish on hook sets. Maybe we're not landing fish or maybe we're feeling we're just not getting the bites that we should be getting. That's the time when it's, I think, important to kind of have some introspective and really start like dissecting, okay, what am I doing? What possibly could be going wrong here? And that's when I think it's important to start looking at wine, right? So mm -hmm. that said, let's break it down. The reason why we're doing this floral versus braid is because this makes up now, I would say probably 98% of, man, maybe 95% of all line sales and conversations, I would say, Definitely. anymore yeah. there's there's still some monos floating around out there there's still a couple copolys floating around out mm -hmm. there but i would say probably 95 percent of anglers that come in and that's just an educated guess number right mm -hmm. are using I, these i would agree absolutely yeah so what are the pros and cons well here's what i can tell you let's start here let's start with floral so the idea of fluoro over say something like a monofilament right the way they build monofilament, so this would be going old school, your strands, your trilanes, you know, those types of lines, right? All of those are built off a nylon core. So essentially they take a piece of yarn and then they coat it, right? And then that coating kind of holds it together and turns it into line. When you have your line in the water, right? The center of your line actually has a thread going through it because that's the nylon piece running down the middle. So in theory, it's more visible because there's a distinct thing running down the middle of your line. And by nature of it being nylon, it's stretchy, right? So it gives quite a bit, right? When fluoro came, it was, it was bridging a gap between nylon and braid, right? So the antithesis to the nylon for a long time was braid, right? So braid has obviously a solid cork, it's all braided, but it has no stretch. So where nylon was a super stretchy line and pretty easy to get ab abrasions and stuff on it, braid was kind of the opposite. It was hard, it was made out of spectra, right? Remember in the beginning, it was like bulletproof vest material, right? Harder to nick and it had no stretch, right? So this was like four wheel drive line. Floral kind of bridged the gap. So it gave you more of a true line, right? So more of a true round shape, but instead of a nylon core, what it is is it's four carbon molecules that are bonded together. So it's actual molecules that are all kind of bonded in a strand and then they're coated. So in theory, because there's not a solid core, it's much less visible underwater. Now, you can find videos and studies to debunk anything you want to debunk. Before you start going crazy, like, oh, I saw this thing that said, you know, mono is less visible than floral or whatever. You decide for yourself. Use mono next time that you're in clear water and see how many bites you get versus using fluoro and then tell me which one is less visible, okay? <laughs> you know we're gonna get a transoptic comment here pretty quick. <laughs> right, right, yeah. There's gonna be some kind of nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, fluoro is less visible than mono. It's also less stretch. So gone because there's not that nylon core you've kind of eliminated most of the stretch. There's still a little bit that's just gonna be inherent in the coating process, right? But you've kind of eliminated that stretch. Now, that coating process we're talking about is one of the keys of what makes a fluoro expensive or inexpensive, right? Because you'll notice that not all fluoros are created the same, mm -hmm. right? There are some sitting over there for 15 bucks a box that feel amazing until the second trip and then they break. Right? And there's some sitting over there that are 40 or $50 a box that are designed to basically last until you can't possibly make another cast anymore. The process of how they coat, how many times they're coated, how it's compressed, all that is what makes a line expensive, inexpensive, lasts a long time, break easy, so on and so forth, right? Now, the nature of fluorocarbon is that it's a sinking line, okay? Now, I, instead of calling fluorocarbon sinking, I like to refer to fluorocarbon as like a neutral density. When I think of sinking, I think of something that you throw in the water and it sinks, 
right? And fluorocarbon isn't really like that. If I lay this in the water, it's not just gonna sink right to the bottom. It's gonna just slowly start sinking. It's almost like a neutral, almost a suspending kind of line, but it'll yeah. just keep going. Have you ever seen like a good glide bait, like how they weight them? If they weight them just right, when you put it on the surface of the water, it'll yep. sit on the surface until it breaks the surface tension, yep. and then it'll slowly float to the bottom, yep. and then it'll almost hit the bottom and almost bounce back It up. almost just kind of stays there, yeah. right? And kind of sits on its hooks. Mm -hmm. So fluorocarbon is very similar to that. It is definitely going to have a slow sinking property to it, which is good and bad, okay? And we'll get to that here in a second. <clears throat> it's a round shape, okay, which is great, which is also uh, a huge plus. So let's, let's just dive in to fluorocarbon and when, when we use it. So yeah. I, I am probably anymore, probably 90% of my reels are spooled with f straight fluoro, mm -hmm. right? So the advantage that I get with straight fluoro is A, it's a round line. So round line versus, let me just open this braid real quick. Since this is the greatest braid in the world, I'm gonna take <laughs> this spool. We can talk about that in a minute. Oh, I'll let you know. Okay, braid, the way they build braid is braid is either built off four strands or eight strands of fibers. And there could be a six strand and you, really whatever number they wanna come up with. But basically what that means is a four strand line They've taken four fibers and they have basically woven them together to create a line. If it's an eight strand, they've taken eight strands of fibers and they've basically figured out a way to weave eight strands all the way up to make a line, okay? Now, because of that, there are grooves in the line. If you just take your fingers and you just roll it down the braid, it's, it's rough, right? It's grooved. Now, when the grooves go through the water, they create sound, okay? It's just science. physics, yeah. physics, it's science. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Thank you, <laughs> right? Science. So, I mean, you can take this line in your pool or in the lake and just pull it and you're gonna hear it, like you'll hear it hum as it goes through the water. Now for me, I'm a big believer in trying to be as natural as I can be at all times, especially when chasing the biggest fish, right? I if I'm shallow, I want my graphs off. I want my trolling motor to hardly be touched. I want people in the boat to be quiet. And I certainly don't want my line going through the water, letting the fish know that something bad potentially is coming, right? So I much prefer the rounder shape of the line that's able to cut through much quieter in the water, and that's floral. Okay, CJ, any? comments on that? No, I agree. I agree, absolutely. Okay. I was never really a huge believer in this until the A-Rig. And when the A-Rig came out, that's when my eyes completely opened. And, and I, I've spoken about this before, but I really credit this to, to Brett. He's the one that really taught this to me. When the A-Rig first came out, Paul Elias won that first event with, I don't know, 120 pounds or whatever, right? Jeez. And Mans was the only one that had an A-Rig at the time. And you could get them on eBay. That was it. And you were spending, I remember the first couple A-Rigs, I spent over 100 bucks an A-Rig just to get my hands on them, right? <laughs> <clears throat> so your, na your natural instinct, of course, is, well, let's tie braid on that, so if I snag it, I can get it back, sure. right? So we did. So everything went on braid. And for the first few trips out, it didn't fucking matter. They ate the shit out of it, hmm. right? But then all of a sudden they stopped eating it and I just figured, oh, well, they're done. They don't need an A-Rig anymore. And I remember a few months later, <clears throat> Brett was asking me, you still throwing the A-Rig? And I said, yeah, they just don't eat it anymore. He goes, are you still throwing it on braid? And I said, yeah. He goes, you can't throw it on braid. You gotta throw it on floral. Hmm. I'm like, well, what difference does it make? I was just thinking visual. Sure. Right, because yeah. the braid has got all these grooves, and it's obviously it's visible. It's not. It's not. You know, there's no light shining through it. Like they could see it, right? I'm like, well, what sense does that make? The A rigs like coat hangers and metal and shit everywhere. And he goes, no, it's the sound. They're hearing that humming coming before the A rig even gets there, and they know it's bullshit. Hmm. And I go, you got to be shitting me. First time out with four, I started catching them again, and ever since I've been paying attention to the different sounds that the line makes. In my mind, it makes a huge difference. Lack of sound is a huge plus for floral. Lack of visibility, again, a huge plus for me 
with fluoro. We fish on the west coast mostly. Our water is crystal clear. So the ability to not see this line is a huge, huge bonus. This is also part of a system, getting back to what we talked about earlier. Depending on how you cast, depending on the rod that you have and the reel that you have, this may be the right line or it may not be the right line. I am a huge believer in geeking out in every piece of my gear. When I have a technique that I wanna do good, like let's say deep cranking, for instance, I get the best rod to deep crank with. I'm just trying to make the rod that's perfectly designed for the technique do its job. So for me, fluoro is just a really neutral line. If you have the right rod and you have the right reel, fluoro is just easy to put on there and let the gear do its job. It's not going to make the rod too fast or you know, too stiff or too direct to contact. It just kind of lets the whole system work and you can learn it really easily in, in the ins and outs and what the breaking strength is and what the castability is, so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people, when they have line issues, it's, it's not so much the line, it's just the gear that they're using. I mean, if you're throwing, like, I guess, so let's say floral, right? Yep. You're, you're trying to throw a jig in shallow water with straight fluoro and you're throwing a super, super stout broomstick of a rod, yeah, you're gonna probably snap off around the knot area or even bend out a hook because there's a little stretch in the fluoro. If you just, you know, if you're fishing five feet of water, super shallow, yep. soften up the rod a little bit and let the rod take in the shock. And maybe you'll have less line trouble. That's a good point. So one of the downsides to fluoro, well, let's just talk about some downsides. So one of the downsides that CJ brings up is this diameter right here is 16 pound, right? This same diameter in braid is 70 pound. The 16 obviously is gonna break way easier than this 70 for the same diameter. Again, because there's not a lot of inherent stretch built into this kind of line, close range, high impact, you have to remember not to set the hook too hard, not to crack the whip, not to have a, a lot of slack line hook sets where you're creating a bunch of oomph and pop in your line, you need to be very controlled and very fluid, mm -hmm. right? It's bit, it's always solid, it's always connected, right? The line will do its job, your rod will do its job, but once you like get bit and you like drop down and, and slack line hook set and you're only 20 feet away and this thing goes pop like that, dude, it's done. Yeah. Done. Yeah. It's right. Funny. Shallow water, it's hard with any line. I mean, if I had to choose between two and super shallow close quarter water, yeah. I'm going fluoro all day. Yeah. Because braid has zero stretch. Right. So you're definitely going to bend out a hook if you don't have the right gear. But at least with fluoro, you can soften up your rod a little bit, take it easy on the, floor, on the, on the hook set, and you'll, you'll be way better off than going like a straight braid hook set. Another inherent downside mm. is manageability. Sure. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So because fluoro is relatively stiff, Right, it is going to maintain the shape of whatever container it's on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for instance, if it's on a spool that's this big, the coils are going to be that size, it's just going to be coily. Right, so you can see it's got the same size coil as the spool. Yep, right. So if you put it on a bait casting spool and the spool is that big, it's going to maintain that shape. So your coils are going to be that size. Okay, so. If you're using it on a regular basis, it'll be a little easier to manage than if you're using it on a semi-regular basis. So if you you know, put your rod away and you don't pick it up for another three or four weeks and you go to pick it back up, this beautiful, soft, slick line that it was when you first pulled it up is now gonna be a pain in the ass. It's gonna be kind of crusty. It's gonna be real coily, right? You have to understand that the manageability of the line may become a problem too. Really easy fix. You can just attach your line to a tree, or I attached to my bumper, and I just kind of walk some line out, and I just pull against it and kind of stretch it, right? And it'll take some of those coils out. All you're doing is you're just taking this line and you're just kind of giving it a little bit of stretch, right? So you're just kind of taking the coils out, and then that way it's just flat instead of those round coils. Now, on a spinning rod, this can become a complete disaster. <laughs> okay, so on a spinning rod, even if you downsize to something like seven pound or eight pound, right, that we use a lot in bass fishing, 
the coils can really become a disaster on spinning. Just the way that it falls off the reel, it you're going to get more twists, you're going to get more knots. It just it's a maintenance disaster in mm -hmm. my opinion. Okay, so for me, spinning rods never get straight for. Them. There's there's zero reason for it in my opinion anymore for this. Obviously, straight fluoro doesn't work worth the shit for top water. Yep. Right? <laughs> because of its sinking prince, you know, yeah, it's just its built into to it. sink. Yeah. yeah, it's going to sink down, it's going to pull your top water underneath. Now, Absolutely. if you're throwing something like a buzz bait or a wake bait or something that's just a, a constant move, no big deal. Right. I throw it on for. Yep. Right? But if you're throwing like a walking bait or popper or something where you know, the belly of the line is gonna have a chance to sink down, you're gonna be in trouble, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, you'll notice it on a real long cast, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Anything else I left out pro or con to fluoro? I would say, so, the nice thing about fluoro yep. is when you're fishing in structure mm -hmm. and your your line's getting constantly nicked up, you can always retie and you have more line ready to go. With braid, you're shaving off a lot of braid if it gets nicked up, right? So like for me, if I'm shallow cranking, throwing like a square bill, around wood, I'm gonna throw that with fluoro because fluoro still has a little bit of abrasion resistance, mm -hmm. more so than like mono, Yep. but one, the braid's gonna dig and you're gonna snag a lot of crankbaits, but two, when I'm fishing fast, I don't I don't wanna worry about retying a leader on braid. Now, obviously, you're never gonna throw treble hook baits on straight braid, so you're gonna have a leader, and if you're constantly nicking up that leader, throwing it in shallow cover, especially wood, you're gonna have, you're gonna spend a lot of time retying versus just having a spool of fluoro ready to go. And you just cut what got nicked up, retie, and you're back in the water. Yep. So, in that sense, when you're trying to work quick and avoid leaders, fluoro is a huge plus. Yeah, and we'll talk about leaders and fluoro to leader mm -hmm. here in a second. It's another nice thing about going straight fluoro is there's one less knot. Yep. So you don't have that leader knot. To, it's another knot that's not going to fail. Here's the thing: braid is pretty fucking strong with knots. Mm-hmm. Right, so when you tie braid, you don't really weaken braid. No. The downside to braid with knots is that a lot of times it's just real slick and it'll slip, mm -hmm. but it never really breaks at a knot. Whereas fluoro, every time you bend it, every time you kink it, right, you're weakening it. Yeah. So when you tie a knot, you've weakened it. You, it may be 16 pound right here, but after you tie the knot, it's 12. Mm -hmm. Right, after you've rubbed it on some rocks down there on the jig, it's 10 yep. or nine or eight. Right? Yeah. Another potential upside to fluoro too is the amount of sizing. So, you know, where braid's gonna have like, especially in the heavier sizes, you're gonna have like 30 pound, 40 pound, 50 pound, 65, 80, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas with fluoro, you could have 10, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, 22, 25, right? There's all these little in-between sizes, which could potentially be important, especially with something like a deep crank. Sure. So a lot of times you're you're hitting your depth at you know a 16 pound, but you need to squeeze an extra foot or two out of it, and you can drop to 14 pound or 15 pound and just squeeze the diameter just slightly to get it down a different depth. So that potentially could be something also yeah. uh, that could be good. Now again, we could do the leader thing, mm -hmm. right? But that's another possible upside. Now, let's jump to let's jump to braid. Where'd my braid go? All right, there you go. Let's talk about some advantages to braid and times that we prefer braid. Now, we just talked that most of our reels are spooled straight floral. You you too? Yeah, most of your I would reels? say ninety percent of my reels are straight floral. Okay. Yeah, for me, for me, braid's a real niche line and for some people it might not be but it's just personal preference but i feel like for braid in its niche does the job the best for me yeah but 90 percent of my reels are going to be straight flora okay real quick we talked about how it's built right by putting these fibers together either four strands or eight strands mm -hmm. braid will come in a lot of different possible options and and the more years that go by the more possibilities come to the market, right? Like yeah. we were just over there looking at all these different braids. Really important if you guys are gonna play in braid that you know what kind of braid you're getting. Braid comes as floating, braid comes as sinking, right? So you could take something like a Sunline FX2 braid, for instance, is a sinking braid, yeah. a pretty quick sinking braid. Mm -hmm. Braid comes as neutral density. So like you guys see us throw this a lot on our spinning rods. So this is Sunline to Fire D braid that's actually weighted to 
sink at about the same rate as fluorocarbon. So if you're doing a braid to fluoro leader, it's going to sink along with the fluoro. And the reason that's important is if you're using a floating braid to uh, say a fluoro leader and you're putting like a jig or something and you're bottom fishing, then what happens is your braid stays floating on the surface of the water all the way until where your bait is actually in. So it's floating, 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 and then it kind of drops down to the bait, right? So you've got this big kind of curve happening, right? Whereas if you have a neutral density braid like this, then your line is sinking at the same rate as your fluoro and you just have a more direct contact with your bait. So your sensitivities improve, things happen faster, <clears throat> right? You have more control over things. You know, for bottom contact stuff, a sinking or a neutral density would make a lot of sense. If you guys are throwing top water, like a frog or a walking bait, then obviously make sure you're getting a floating braid so it's not pulling your, your bait down. Different braids will have different coatings as well on them. So some will come coated. So they'll come with like a waxy coating. The idea is a couple things. It's A, to make this a little less grooved and more of a round shape. It's to quiet the sound as it goes through your guides. A lot of people complain that, ah, oh, that braid's just so noisy, mm -hmm. right? So uh, maybe just from all the years of gigging, my ears are shot. Like, I don't hear it. It doesn't bother me. It's kind of like a DC reel. Do DC reels bother you? No, I actually like the sound. Yeah, so they've, I, dude, I honestly don't ever even hear them. It's just one of those things. I'm just sounds. fishing, I just fish. I never pay attention, it's never like, oh man, the reel sounds so cool or so shitty. But a <laughs> lot of people come in like, I hate the sound of that DC reel. It's like, ah, it's so weird. It's even... like a 50-50 thing, it's weird. Right, so same thing with the sound of braid going through guides. Some people just don't like the sound of it, and that's, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Some braid also will be water absorbing or not water absorbing. So you'll notice when you start shopping for braid, you could find braid for $9.99 a spool, and you could find something like this for like $56 a spool. The more expensive braids, generally they're more strands. They're generally put together in a softer, more you know, easy to manage way. They're designed or treated or coated in a way to where they don't absorb water. And this is important because if your braid's absorbing water, it might be floating out of the box, but as it absorbs water, all of a sudden it starts sinking and you're like, what the fuck, it was just walking fine and now my bait's not walking. It's because your braid's now heavy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just like a shirt, right? So your cotton shirt's all nice and light until it's full of water and yeah. then it just weighs down on you, yeah. right? Yeah. Same idea here. Now, if you are a braid fan, you could certainly put this on all your spools. The advantage is, is technically it doesn't break down as quick as a fluorocarbon or a mono, so you could get longer life out of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's limper, mm -hmm. so you don't have to worry about the coils, right? So, I mean, it doesn't really have any memory. No, not right? at all. Very so, memorable. yeah, it's super easy to manage, so if it sits on a reel for a long period of time, it's just the same as when you first put it on, yep. which is great. You can also utilize leader. So, you know, even though this is super highly visible, you can easily just tie on leaders of different lengths to create a buffer zone of invisibility or little extra stretch, you know, shock absorption, I guess. Mm -hmm. So you can do leaders of any size, right, to this to create a buffer between the braid and the bait. Another big advantage to braid is you can get it in some bright ass colors. Oh yeah. So I know this isn't a big deal for you because you're still super young, but <laughs> as you get older, it's a pain in the ass to see a dark green or a clear line 100 feet out there. It sure is nice, especially like if you're fishing current or rivers, to be able to tell where the fuck your line is, <laughs> right? So you could get it in a chartreuse, you can get it in pink, like you can get it in colors that you can actually visibly see, and you can utilize the leader to create that little buffer or cushion in between, right? Mm -hmm. So that the fish aren't seeing it as well. Right. Right? Or in Ben's case, get a bobber. Yeah, that's what I do. I love <laughs> love that bobber. Now, uh, spinning wise, spinning reel wise, always 100% braid. Yeah. And the reason is solely manageability because that fluorocarbon is just so coily and it, it's just so difficult to manage. You're gonna sacrifice casting distance it's too coily and all those coils are forced through the guides, right? They're hitting the rod. So your, your casting distance is gonna be less with straight fluoro. Your cast distance is gonna go up with braid. It's gonna be easier to manage. 
And leader knots are so simple that you can create any buffer you need and do everything you need to do uh, on this. Now the one exception, the one asterisk I would put in there is if you're using spinning to do a lot of reaction bait stuff, mm -hmm. I would probably still do straight floral. If you can get away with it, absolutely. Yeah, I just, I don't know why you would use a spinning rod to do a lot of reaction stuff. Right. But if you had to for some reason, right? Uh, or maybe you're just, you're racist against bait casters. Hey, there's some people out there. Like yeah, that. I've heard. Then I would probably still do a straight floral just for the sound. Piece, but my god that's going to be a disaster oh, to manage get maybe a trip and then that line would be so coiled up yeah it would suck but but typically you're using spinning for finesse applications anyways you're right. going to want the sensitivity for that so right. you probably wouldn't run into that problem right but if if you did just throw a bait caster that's a good point too so because there's less stretch in braid it mm -hmm. is going to be more sensitive yep also this is going to cut through vegetation absolutely amazingly well Sometimes so if, you have to have braid on your reels. For yeah. guys that fish in like Florida, I mean, they're around grass and pads. I mean, floral is not going to be able to cut through all that like braid's going to be able to. Right. On the flip side, if you're a guy in Texas or you're a guy like here in Arizona where you're fishing around a lot of wood, this might be the absolute worst thing you could do because just like it cuts through grass, it's also going to try to cut through wood, yep. only it doesn't fully make it through the wood a lot of times it cuts in and then it sticks mm -hmm. and a lot of times like if you're flipping wood you yep. know stumps or big wooden trees where your line is kind of laying over it like deeper water like if i'm flipping in two feet probably not a big deal right but if i'm flipping a big wood tree that's in 15 feet and i want my bait to get down through all the branches down to the bottom and i get bit at the bottom and i got to swing and this line is laying against all those branches a lot of times that line will cut into the branch and you can't move it. Mm. And you swear you're snagged, but you're not. It's the line is actually wedged into the wood. So yeah. potentially that could be a pro or a con depending on where you are and how you're fishing mm -hmm. that way as well. Because it's four or eight strands and it's got that texture, it literally will saw its way through. Yes, so. yeah. And as far as the difference between, do you choose a four strand, do you choose an eight strand? Four strand is generally built to be a little bit more durable because you have four pieces that are twice the size of the eight pieces that are creating the same line. Typically that's how this is determined is four strand is kind of touted as being more durable and eight strand is being touted as like softer because there's eight pieces, right? Yeah. Dude, I haven't used four strand in like a decade. Yeah. I, you could <laughs> never convince me to use, well, I take that back. This is, this is not eight strand. This is four strand. But it's a special right? type of line. But it's a special four strand, yeah. right? So it's got a core, it's got some different stuff happening. Mm -hmm. For everything else, I'm pretty much, I stay here, right? So these are the two, I mean, there's a gazillion good braids out there. Yep. I am a major fan of this line. This is Daiwa Samurai Braid with J Braid Grand being my second closest. You hate this line. You know, I, I just haven't had good experiences with it. Yeah. I really haven't. I've had uh, some issues, Yep. but I love Grant. That one has been a staple for me. So this is what I love about these conversations is that, again, there's not a right or wrong mm -hmm. that's black and white. There's just a right or wrong for you. There's a right or wrong for me. So if something's not working for you, hopefully we're having some good conversation and putting some info out that maybe yeah. it'll help you. Yeah. But it might also help you avoid something. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. Here's my experience with braid on bait casters. I used to play with this a lot and, okay, if I want this technique, I'm gonna put 30 pound, or if I want this technique, I want 40 pound, or this, you know, oh, flip and punch, I need 70 or 80, right? And then, a couple years ago, Kenta was in here, and we started talking about frog fishing. And we started, I started asking, like, what line are you throwing? And he's like, 80 pound, 70 or 80 pound. I'm like, wow, even on like Slither K, like a real light frog, yeah. he goes, no. Yeah for everything, always heavy, heaviest you can get. Wow, really? I'm like, why, it doesn't even make any sense. He goes, and he started explaining to me the physics behind it, and then I started applying it and just seeing for myself, and he was totally right, all right? Really? So everything I'm, I'm telling you right now is not my, it, Kenta totally taught this to me. I just, it's not I didn't believe him. Sure. I, I believed him, but I needed to go out and prove it to myself, and now I've, I, I'm convinced, he's right. Hmm. 
So one of the challenges to braid is a lot of times it'll dig in your reel, yep. right? If you're somebody like me who spends most of my day, most of my casting stroke is super easy. And all of a sudden I'm casting and then all of a sudden I see a boil or I see something super dope happen and I wind in and I try to throw really hard <laughs> yeah, after yeah. I've just been throwing super lazy and now I try mm -hmm. to throw hard and that line freaks out and like digs in yep. and midway through my cast it, it digs and it stops and my bait flops and my cast is fucked and I'm like, God, you know, it, it's just, it's frustrating, right? And I hear that a lot, that people get really frustrated casting braid. What I've discovered with fluorocarbon and mono, the lighter the line, the easier it is to cast and the more distance you're gonna get. Mm -hmm. The thicker the line, the harder it is to cast and the less distance you're gonna get. With braid, I find it to be the exact opposite. Now this is only on casting. Mm -hmm. On spinning, same right. rules apply. Yep. But on casting, the bigger the braid, the less it digs. So it's like it just maintains its roundness and doesn't have the same urge to dig, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it all comes down to diameter, right? Totally. Like 70 pounds way thicker than 15 pound. Right. So 15 can slip in between the individual threads on the spool way easier than 70 yep. pound. Yep. So for me, with braid on baitcaster, it's 100% of the time 65 or 70 pound for me. No need to ever go to 50 or 40 or 30. I don't even know. I wish they didn't even make it. <laughs> I wish they made like 20, 15, 10 for spinning, and then 65, 70, 80 for casting. If you're having some troubles with braid and you've been you've been using it and you want to use it, but you're frustrated that it keeps digging or maybe keeps breaking on impact, right? Which is something that we've been talking about yeah, too. Sure. Maybe try to actually go up in size. I know it seems the opposite of what we've, you know, programmed ourselves to think, but it actually makes a pretty big difference with mm -hmm. braid to go up in size and up in diameter. It's much easier to manage. Yeah, absolutely way easier i guess my personal opinion when it comes to braids or lighter braids more specifically mm -hmm. yep so if i'm throwing like say for example i'm throwing like a light jerk bait or something like that and some of this plays into the setup too okay but for me when i'm throwing a real light small jerk bait especially for you trout guys this is going to be real applicable um braids going to be my choice over fluoro typically when i'm throwing a jerk bait I'm going to throw a straight fluoro. When I'm full, throwing like a full size 110, something like that, I want to yep. throw a straight fluoro because okay. it handles the bait the best. But when you get to those really light lures, it seems like fluoro doesn't come off the spool as smoothly as a braid would. For and when you're talking light. really light, you're talking like yep. below like a quarter of an ounce. Small, small Three lures. sixteenths, sixteenth, mm -hmm. eighth. Right. More like BFS or true trout sure. sized stuff. Sure. Okay. Something yep. smaller, I think braid just comes off the spool at that diameter and at that weight smoother than fluorocarbon does. Uh, that could be a personal preference thing. But whenever I'm going up to those bigger, like full size 110s or 90 sizes, I'm still going straight for Yeah. It's just something to throw in there. Yeah, I I agree. So I, I think you nailed it. Well, let's talk about this. We haven't really talked about when we use braid over four as far as technique skill. Sure. Yeah, okay. for me, it's, I mean, it's super niche -y. Like, uh, like I said, it's, there's a few applications that I would throw braid to leader night and day over fluoro. And typically that's when I'm fishing super deep or if I'm throwing straight braid into really thick green vegetation, like flipping, uh, frogging, punching, right, punching, frogging. Other than that, I'm pretty much using exclusively when I'm fishing probably 25 feet or more and I need like superior contact, say the fish are eating kind of mushy, and I need to be able to feel every little pebble down there, then I'm gonna throw a braid. So completely. like something like a jig or something down deep, you like to do braid, yep. just to give yourself some increased sensitivity. Yep, exactly. Okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So for me, spinning 100% of the time. Yep. <clears throat> I don't switch to this for deep water contact. I stay in fora, personal preference, right? But everything that you said in shallow cover, so punching, mm -hmm. anything green, vegetation, toolies, grass, that kind of stuff, yep. frogs, right? Braid, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. The other thing I use braid for a lot is walking topwater baits. So yep. I, will, I will throw braid almost always on a walking topwater bait because with a walking topwater bait, I'm almost always trying to get max distance. If I'm fishing close range, I'm just like throwing, skipping under a dock or fishing close range, 
then I'll, I'll stay in a mono. And we'll do another segment on mono. Most of the time, probably 95% of the time I throw in a walkie bait, I'm making a bomb cast. Mm -hmm. Open water, cross a point, somewhere really far. The braid will give me further casting distance than a mono because it doesn't have the coil, yep. right? So just by nature, it's gonna come off the spool and cast. But the other thing it does is so many times you make that huge long cast as far as you can cast and then you walk the bait twice and boom, they blow up and you're 200 feet away, the braid gives you a chance to actually get a hook set. Yeah. If you have 200 feet of mono between you and, and the biting fish, yep. there's so much stretch happening that you have no chance of actually setting yeah. a hook. No shot. No. So when I do that, it's braid to a floral leader. Mm -hmm. It's always fluoro, never mono braid to a floral leader. My floral leader is generally two to four foot long, mm -hmm. short. So I'm just looking to give myself a little bit of cushion of, I guess, invisibility, but less invisibility and more just so the bait doesn't wrap on the braid. If I throw straight braid to treble hook baits, a lot of times when you go to cast and the bait kind of flails, it's easy for the line to wrap in the hooks and yep. it just drive you nuts, yep. right? Oh, yeah. So giving myself a little bit of cushion. Now, the reason why you can get away with floral is a leader when you're doing a real short amount even though it sinks it's not the sinking at the bait that's the problem it's the sinking at the belly yep. right so if i've made a hundred foot cast it's the line that's sinking from my rod tip to the bait that's pulling it down mm -hmm. but if my braid is floating right that first two feet or four feet to the bait is never gonna have a chance to sink because it's moving it's getting pulled and pushed as that bait's moving so mm -hmm. i just like floral Gives me the invisibility, the abrasion resistance. I'm used to it, right? So that's really the only other time I'll do it. Now, I don't like braid on topwater baits like a buzz bait. Right. And a lot of people do. A lot of people like braid on a buzz bait. Of course, if you're fishing in aquatic vegetation, you may have to do this if you need it to kind of cut through. But be careful with single hook baits and braid because there's no stretch, right? You have a tendency to set the hook and that one big hook tears. So it's almost like a, like a, a gaff, almost, yeah, yeah. right? It gets in the mouth and it just pulls and tears and it creates a huge hole in the fish. And you guys know when you hook a fish on, on top water, it usually goes apeshit. Oh yeah. It's usually jumping and thrashing and it's right there at the surface. And if you tear a hole in the fish's mouth, it's really easy for that bait to fall out. But walking baits where there's treble hooks and they're usually on the outside and it's usually from a really long way away the braid does help get some kind of hook penetration so you could actually land those yeah. fish for me. I mean, I think a lot of baits you can throw on braid to leader. The absolute biggest no-no baits that I wouldn't ever throw on braid, even braid to leader, would be any kind of crankbait with trebles. Yep. Any, like most crankbaits have trebles. Anything like that. Walking baits are an exception because long cast, you need that, that contact. Chatterbait is a big one too. I know some guys that like throw chatterbaits around grass and they like going with braid to leader to cut through the grass. Same thing. I think when you hook a fish on braid with a chatterbait, you're just going to tear up the fish and you're likely to bend the hook. You're not going to get great contact. It's not. There's a lot that could go wrong. There's so many little niche things with braid uh, that I think if you, overall, I think if you were to throw most of your reels with fluoro, you could do most things. And then when you find those situations where you need a braid to leader, it's going to outperform and that specific task. So basically what we're cutting this, this down to, mm -hmm. right, is no matter what line you choose, mm -hmm. there's basically a few categories that you need to have, like you need to be checking off. Right. The first category should be ease of use. Yeah. You gotta be able to cast it, right? Yeah. You want it to be fun to cast, you want it to enjoy, because you're gonna be casting 100% of your day. Oh yeah. Right, the catching fish part is probably a really small <laughs> part of your day, mm -hmm. but your casting is all day. So you need to enjoy that. So the line has to be able to cast the way you want to cast. That should be check number one, yep. right? Check number two is it has to be able to work the bait properly. Mm -hmm. So whether it's floating, whether it's sinking, whether you're feeling the sensitivity or not, it has to, has to give you the performance that you want from whatever bait it is that you're doing. That should be number two. Number three is you got to get a bite. I would bet anybody, okay, especially Ethan, <laughs> right? But I am convinced that if I go head to head with any kind of reaction bait, anything that's moving through the water, swim bait, crank bait, jerk bait, any of the stuff that you just talked about, 
and I'm throwing straight floral and you're throwing braid to a leader, I'm gonna get more bites. Oh yeah, I'd agree. 100%, mm -hmm. right? People are gonna argue it and that's fine if you fig you guys figure it out for yourselves, right? Trial and error, you guys determine it. I've already determined it for myself. I'm a firm believer that you just get more bites on round line than you do woven line, Yeah. okay? So that should be check number three. Are you getting the bites you should be getting? Check number four is, are you getting the fish in the boat that you're hooking? And this is a big one that people forget to check off. Mm -hmm. And this is the same checklist that should be for rods too. Oh yeah. Right? Because it's really easy to get a bite, but it's really easy to lose fish mm -hmm. too if you have the wrong gear. Yep. So are the fish getting in the boat? And if they're not, it's easier to start with the line than it is the rod because yep. you can change this for 15 bucks whereas the rod could be hundreds of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So start with the line, then go to the rod, then go to the reel, then go to mechanics or however, whatever system you want to do. But that should be kind of the checklist. Oh yeah. Performance, moves the bait correctly, gets the bite, actually lands the fish. Yep. I think to keep it simple, that'd be the best way to approach it. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully that was informative. Do we, do we leave anything out? Did we no, miss anything? I think, I think we went down plenty of rabbit holes. We went down actually a deeper rabbit hole than I thought. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was going to be two or three beers in, but, but that's the we've, thing I've been talking. Wine. Yeah. That's, I think it just scares a lot of people, and I think everyone has their own style of fishing. Everyone's fishing different conditions, so it's really hard to just pin, like, hey, fluorocarbon's the best, or hey, braid's the best. Like, it's the best to your style and the best to, it could be the best of how the conditions are that day, you know? For sure. Like something crazy as wind comes into the in, in play. Like little things like that determine on what kind of line you need. And I think once you dial that in, you'll be a lot more efficient when you're fishing. So the correct answer, at the end of all of this, what we have decided is Pline. just throw this. Yeah. Yeah. Throw floral. Floral clear. Screw this braid. Yeah. Now, hopefully that was that was useful for you guys. And remember, it's all a system. If you have too soft of a rod and you need to make it faster. This can also do that. If you have too stiff of a rod and you need to make it softer, this could also do that, right? So you could use lines to your advantage as needed. But the biggest thing is just learn, learn the line. Become intimate with it. Learn what it can do, what it can't do, where the breaking strength is, what cast it can do well, what cast it doesn't do well. And then identify for yourself what's working and stay in that lane or what's not working and then find an alternative to that lane, maybe by playing with some different lines, yep, right? Absolutely. If you guys have questions on anything that we covered, or maybe you're finding yourself in a corner and you can't really figure out where things are derailing or going wrong, CJ and I are happy to talk about this. I mean, obviously, <laughs> we just talked an hour about two stupid lines, lines. right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I feel like we just started going down some of the possibilities too. Oh my gosh, right? we could go on forever about yeah. this. So if you have questions, drop it down below and we'll definitely get to it. Of course, you can always DM us on Instagram as well. We basically both uh, always live there as well. So if you do drop a comment and we don't get back to it, shoot us a DM and we can go through it. We'll leave links to some of our favorite lines. Both CJ and I are pretty similar. We've got a couple differences. I'm mm -hmm. right, he's wrong. But if you want to try <laughs> some wrong ones, didn't I say that earlier, that there's definitely black and white, right and wrong? Yeah, Yeah. the only difference between our said. lines is mine get fish in the boat. Okay, That's the only difference. This, is, this is where we're going Now we're this. attacking each other. Okay. All right, let's wrap right. this video up. On that, guys, thank you for giving us time. Hopefully that was useful. Uh, again, any questions, drop them down below, and we will see you guys soon. Thank you guys for the time. Thank you for your business. Thank you for your support, and we'll see you in the next one. Peace. CJ, see ya. I'm getting another beer. Peace out, guys. Thanks for watching.